Welcome to a special edition of Wall Street Week, the show of record for long-term investing. I'm Anthony Scaramucci, coming to you from the Democratic National Convention in Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Last week, the Republicans in Cleveland spent a lot of time on jobs and the economy, and that was one of the topics here in Philadelphia, but there was also a lot of criticism of Wall Street and wealthy people in America. One top Democrat here is a longtime Wall Street titan, Robert Wolf. He's the former CEO of UBS Americas, and he's a personal friend of President Barack Obama. He says if you want to vote for a fiscal conservative, then you should be voting for Hillary Clinton and not Donald Trump. And so let's listen. You know, I found it incredibly interesting myself because most Republicans are deficit hawks. But the Center uh, for Responsible Budget came out looking at both plans. Now, I understand both plans are still in their beginning stages. But based on what both candidates have said to date, from taxes to military spending to infrastructure spending, it has come out that Donald's plan over the next decade plus will add somewhere around $11 trillion to our deficit. Some even have it at $20 trillion whereas Secretary Clinton's would add $250 billion. So my argument to those that I would say are center-right, and both right now everyone's fighting for the center-right and center-left because the far left and far right are going to go their way. I would say if you are a fiscally conservative Republican, you have to make sure you understand Secretary's, Secretary Clinton's plan because I could argue it's better for, if that's what your main thought is about how you vote. Okay, and so there's a debate about his plan as it relates to growth and yeah. the economic opportunity, but I want to keep going because yeah. this is your time. Okay, let's thank talk you. about let's talk about infrastructure. Okay, that's a big part of her economic yeah. development plan, and so give us your thoughts on her infrastructure Listen, plan. Listen, as you and I have spoken. Both sides are talking about infrastructure as a growth trajectory for our country. And I have seen Secretary Clinton's plan, and I, and I saw some of Donald Trump's plan. And I would say, when you look at the depth and breadth of Secretary Clinton's plan, it's best in class. I mean, as you know, uh, in, in my working for the President of the United States, I helped write the National Infrastructure Bank plan. I testified in front of the Senate on it. And it's clear to me that infrastructure is the fastest job growth we can do for wages. So, but, so Robert, why don't you think we haven't gotten more infrastructure during President Obama's administration? Because, one, when he put the infrastructure plan into Congress, it got voted down. Because at that time, everyone thinks anything involved with the government is like the next GSEs. Oh, we're building the next Fannie and Freddie. What they fail to realize is we're the only developed country without a national infrastructure bank. And when I think infrastructure, Anthony, one, for every billion dollars spent, it's 25 to 30,000 jobs. For every dollar spent, it's a 1.6 multiplier. But as you and I chatted, it's not just roads and bridges. It's ports that will help exports. It's it's fiber. It's it's um, you know broadband. It's next generation GPS. It's satellite and it's social infrastructure, which you and I care the most about: education and hospitals. And so we need to make sure there's over three trillion of dollars ready to be spent on in infrastructure. So I think that's a job creator. But we have to get Congress to work with the executive branch to get things done. Okay, so there's there's some tension here. Uh, there's a tension between the Bernie Sanders camp and the Secretary Clinton camp, and there's a big issue in the United States right now about jobs and high-quality jobs and the wage inequality in the United States. So what's her plan to close that? There's no question where we came from. We have moved great mountains, but we have many more mountains to come. We were losing 800,000 jobs a year, a month, when you and I were during the Lehman crisis. Today, we're adding 200,000 jobs. We have 75 months straight of job growth. But it has not really, I would say, trickle-down economics has not worked. We, what we really... So who's trickle-down economics, though? Well, for the most part, we have had where the, 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 we have had what I would say a consumer driven country where we think because the wealthy are getting wealthy, well, they spend more and they spread the wealth. And that's the old trickle down economics impact. That really hasn't worked the last decade, mainly because at the end of the day, we're having struggling post recovery to get real jobs. Okay, but these, these are policies in the last eight years. We can't blame. President Bush anymore. These are eight not, years of I'm not, no, no. I understand that, but you're saying trickle downs. I'm just trying to understand it. So, so where where we are right now, though, is that the wealthy have sort of made back their money from the 2008 crisis. 
but the middle and, and working classes feel like they're still struggling for the, wage growth. There's no question we have to figure out income inequality. No one, there is no magical wand. As I said, I think infrastructure will do a lot. Skills training will do a lot. And the other thing is we need mobility back. One of the things that killed us the most with this recent um, recession is that when we had a post-recession bump, it was usually 4 to 5 percent. Half of that growth came from housing. One percent came from consumer. One percent from the manufacturing. We don't have the housing bump because people partly aren't mobile and there isn't lending going on. So we have to get, you know, housing and building and back that, And that's true. There are still some houses from the crisis in certain areas of the country that are underwater, and so these people have not benefited from refinancing. The president will exit the White House uh, the eight years that won't be one quarter of at least 3% growth. Do you attribute that to the crisis? Do you attribute that to his policies? Or what do you think has happened where he'll be the first president in modern history where we don't have the 3% growth? Well, he's also the first president that have had 75 straight months of private sector job gains. Um, we've you know, I'm not, I'm not picking on the president. No, this I is know, not me picking on him. I'm just trying to understand, like, do you think, if from a policy perspective, could something different have been done, and will something be different done in the future? Listen, I, it, it's hard to really understand why the recovery has gone as slow. I know people say regulation. That's actually not accurate. Partly is, um, I actually think we've had a technological revolution. The whole idea of bricks and mortars are yesterday. I mean, I don't know about your family, but my family shops, you know, you know, via the internet. They're going on Amazon and eBay all day. So I think we have to. Don't mention sure. shopping to my family, okay? I have, I've got teenage kids that are br brutalizing me. I, listen, I think we have to make sure that we get the skills right, where people are ready for the next sector. There's, there are millions of jobs available in engineering, okay? And we actually bring most of our engineers from overseas. What's amazing to me is we educate them here, and then because of a bad immigration policy, which we both agree needs to be fixed, we force them to go back, and then we have this whole void of our needs here. So I think, I think the importance of STEM and skilling, and I know we all say these same things, but I think it's also critically important that the executive branch and Congress work together. <laughs>